back into John chapter 8. So uh, we are diving right into the, the middle of the conversation um, or teaching slash argument that Jesus is having with uh, these people. It's both Pharisees and then Jews in general here uh, in the location of the temple. So uh, hopefully you took the time to read today's passage. If you want to uh, take the time to uh, just remind yourself of the full context, you'd start back in verse 12 and then read up uh, to where we are or even read to the end of the chapter. So um, that can be helpful and I would suggest that. You don't have to do that, obviously. Um, but in the last segment, Jesus has been teaching here. You have to remember that this whole time, um, Jesus is, is trying to help these people. He is trying to show them their spiritual state. He's only telling them good things. Okay? Now, good things does not mean that it is easy things, as uh, you can pick up. Okay? Conviction is not fun. Uh, being told that you're wrong is not fun. Um, so, Jesus started off in this, in this conversation here in the temple, and he's telling the, these people that they need light. Man's problem is darkness. Man's need is to have spiritual light. And the urgency there is that we are spiritually, we are dead without Christ. Without God, we are spiritually dead. And so here we go. We pick up into verse 30, and it says, as he had said that, as he spake these words in verse 30, it says, many believed on him. And you think, well, that's good. The, kind of the unfortunate truth here that's, that's revealed by the rest of the passage is kind of like we've talked about before, that there, there is shallow faith here. When it says these people believe on him, their statement reveals that they have a surface belief in Jesus. They like some of what he's saying, but they don't want to come to that point of, of placing their trust in what, his, in what he is saying, placing their trust in his words. So Jesus is telling them, man is in spiritual darkness. He needs light. It's urgent because man is spiritually dead. And I categorized it like this, starting in verse 30. So the next thing that Jesus says, the next uh, thing that man needs, I put it like this, that man's freedom, if man is to have freedom, then man needs truth. And that's what these, these Jewish people need, is they need truth in order to have spiritual freedom. That's what you and I need, is we need truth to have spiritual freedom. It's the case for every person on the planet. So, verse 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So what's, what's Jesus saying here? Okay. Everyone wants truth. We all want to know what the right thing is. We all want freedom. Everyone wants freedom. Uh, and both are found in Jesus. And so again, just to remind yourself that Jesus is trying to give the people truth. He's trying to give them something good. So we have all these people who have a surface belief on Jesus. And so Jesus kind of gives them this, uh, it's something more to think about, all right? And I put it like this, in verse 31, 32, Jesus is saying, a follower of Jesus is, is known by his consistency, okay? He's not saying, uh, you know, if you do the right things, then you'll become my disciple. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's, the, the statement there, if you continue in my word, that shows you are my disciple, okay? Maybe the way we could say it. A follower of Christ is known uh, by his consistency. And along with that, when you know Christ, when you, you have a relationship with God, then you can know truth. So a follower of God can know truth and therefore uh, have freedom. Knowing the truth of the gospel gives freedom to live life. Freedom in, in thinking about this, freedom in knowing what's right and wrong. God gives that to us. He gives us the way that we're supposed to li live life, and there's, there is freedom in that. It's not a constriction to follow Christ. It is, it is freeing to, to give your life to the Lord. As uh, 
almost contradictory, contradictory as that can sound, that is the truth of the gospel. So, but what's the problem with these people? Okay, remember it's saying these people believe on him. But when Jesus makes that statement, it starts grating against them. Okay, despite some level of belief, the problem is, is that they are blinded by their sin. And so that's the next uh, several verses that we'll look at here is that man's blindness is his sin. Okay, we are blind. People are blind to their sin. All right. Look at their response in verse 33. It says, they answered him, we, the Abraham seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus brings up this, this aspect of, of spiritual freedom, and they, they hear that, okay? And they're not talking about, about physical uh, uh, slavery or, or bondage, okay? Because any Jew would know his history. He would know uh, about... Um, the exile, okay? They're only several hundred years removed from coming back from Babylonian exile. They know about their history in Egypt, okay? So they are speaking of uh, spiritual slavery here, and they're saying, we're of Abraham's line. We're, we're not spiritually enslaved. So how could, we, how could we summarize that? They're saying spiritual lineage is our righteousness, they're saying, we're descended from Abraham. We've never been enslaved to sin. So because we're Israelites, we've always been God's people, is the way that they're putting it. How does Jesus respond to that? He's, they say, we're not enslaved. We've never been enslaved to sin. And Jesus says, verse 34, I'm telling you the truth, an emphatic statement of truth. Whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Uh, John echoes this statement in, um, in the book of 1 John, in the letter of 1 John. And so it's not just saying if you, uh, if you sin, you're not a Christian. That's not what, what Jesus is saying here. But someone who lives in sin is serving sin. And so Jesus is saying, well, if you live in sin, then you're a servant of sin. So therefore, where do you think your, your spiritual state is at? And then he gives this, this illustration, okay, he's continuing with the illustration here of, of being a slave to sin. Whoever commits sin is the servant or the slave of sin. And look at verse 35. And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So Jesus gives this, uh, this house illustration, and it's you're, the first time you read that, you might be a little bit confused, but it's a pretty, it's a fairly simple statement, okay? Because remember, he's going from this topic of, of a slave, okay? And who can give freedom to a slave? What he's saying here is that a slave has no right in, in, in a house, okay? You have to think back to the, their culture and, and having, you know, you have a rich family who has slaves, and they're, in this culture, they're a different... Um, there's a hierarchy there, right? A family member is not the same as a household slave, okay? So he's saying a slave has no right to the house, but the son does. The son or the heir to the home uh, has the, uh, the continuation in that home. The son is going to inherit his home from his father. Think about that, okay? So only the son can give freedom to a slave. Only, only someone part of the family can give a different status to the slave. Does that make sense? So only the heir can give freedom to a slave. So think about this. They're claiming Abraham, okay? And Abraham, their lineage in Abraham as their, their righteousness, if you will. And Jesus is saying, Abraham was human. He was a finite human. He was a sinner himself. And so their bloodline connection, while that links them, to, links them to God's promises in Abraham, that doesn't give them eternal life. And Jesus is saying, again, he uses that word son there on purpose. Jesus, as the son, he has the right and the ability to give freedom to anyone. But what do they need to do? They need to come to him. They need to turn to him. So that's why he says in verse 37, I know 
that you're Abraham's seed. I know that you're of Abraham's bloodline. Okay, I realize that you're Jews, but that doesn't uh, do anything for you. Okay, that a religious line, a religious bloodline does not save you. That does not make you righteous before God. Verse 38, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. So he's uh, um, making a statement here, okay, that their actions show their spiritual state. Back up to verse 37, there's that phrase there. He says, I know that ye are Abraham's line, or Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. So their actions show their spiritual state, their desire. There's Jews in this crowd who want to see Jesus dead. And so their actions show, I mean, it's a murderous heart that they're showing there, right? And he says, uh, your actions show where your heart is at. He says, and you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I put it like this, because that word, that phrase, hath no place in you, it, it has the idea of making no progress. So they are hearing Jesus' words, but it's not progressing into their hearts. It's just staying surface level. So the truth that Jesus is giving them is not penetrating their hearts. It's not changing their hearts. Their spiritual state is the same. It's a lot. There's a lot here. And Jesus is, he has to get very harsh here, right? Because of, of their attitude towards him. So man's uh, blindness, he's blind to his sin. And then now they're on this topic of lineage and bloodline to Abraham. And Jesus is going to make this statement that man's lineage is more linked to Satan than anything. Okay? And he's going he's gonna to make a couple statements here, and, and you already have an idea if you've read all the way through the end of the passage. Okay? So here we go. We'll... We pick up in verse 39 here, and we'll continue down through verse 45. So Jesus says uh, in verse 38, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. And so that kind of makes their hackles rise a little bit, okay? That's offensive to them because they've already brought up Abraham, and Jesus says, no, you're not acting like the children of Abraham. And we'll continue down this thought. Uh, so verse 39, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So what's Jesus saying there? First they say, well, they, they reemphasize Abraham's our father. Okay. And Jesus response there in verse 39, he essentially says, if you're Abraham's children, then act like Abraham's children. Um, If you were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. So Jesus is saying, well, forget about your, your spiritual lineage. Your actions don't match up to what you're claiming. Okay? So I got a question here for you. I want you to pause and think about this question. Try and come up with an answer here, okay? When, uh, when Jesus brings up the, the works of Abraham, okay? The works of Abraham in verse 39 and down through verse 41. What does, here's the question, what does Jesus mean by the works of Abraham? What does Jesus mean by the works of Abraham? Hopefully we'll, we'll answer as we move along here, okay? And uh, hopefully you didn't overthink that question too much. Okay, but what does Jesus mean here? He says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. I mean, think about this. What was the works that Abraham did that made him righteous before God? If you think, uh, if you go to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, talking about uh, the faith of the patriarchs, okay? Uh, that's what we often call the, the hall of faith because it's all about people throughout the Old Testament who lived by faith. And what does it say about Abraham? It says that Abraham believed God, and that was accounted to him for righteousness. When Abraham's uh, first brought up, if you go to Genesis chapter 12, and the first four verses there, what you find is God giving Abraham instructions, 
and then Abraham's works, which is simply obedience. Abraham didn't go and do sacrifices, and that's what made him righteous. He didn't go and you know, try and be a good person, and that's what made him righteous. No, Abraham was a sinner, right? Abraham messed up a lot, but he was obedient to God, and he had a heart of obedience. And that's what these people are missing. They're so focused on their bloodline to Abraham that they're missing the aspect of obedience to God. That's, that's the connection that they're supposed to have, is obedience to God, not uh, a link to a person. So Jesus says, uh, you're trying to kill me, in verse 40, okay? So, so follow with me. Verse 39 and verse 40, he says, But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. He says, you're not acting like Abraham's children. You're not following Abraham's example. You do the works of your father. You're showing your colors and your allegiance. And your allegiance is not to God. So then they come back with this insistence on a pure bloodline. Verse 41, Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. And uh, the idea here being is that they're, they're linking. Okay, we, we are uh, that pure bloodline that links directly to God. Okay? But you think about how often was Israel called an evil and adulterous generation? How many times are they compared to you? All throughout the Old Testament, every time they went after other gods, that God called that adultery. Okay? It, the idea of, of a wife cheating on her husband. Okay? And that's, that's all throughout Israel's uh, history. And they say, our father is God. And Jesus replied then, and again, this just goes back and forth, back and forth. Jesus replied then, is that if you love God, that would produce an, accept, an acceptance of Jesus. He says, if God, verse, 40, verse, verse 42, if God were your father, your, man, I cannot talk right now. If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Jesus is saying, I'm trying to give you truth. And if you were trying to follow God, you would recognize the truth that I'm giving to you. But you don't want to recognize uh, the truth I'm giving to you, and that shows where your heart with God is at. So what's these people's problem? What's the problem of people today? So they won't let Jesus' words take any effect. They refuse to hear. Verse 43, Jesus says, Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? You won't listen. They're hearing his words, but they, they won't take it past their, their brain and into their heart and, and seek to understand and be changed. That's, they, they're refusing to do that. They're opposed to truth. And that's where Jesus goes. He really gets strong with his statement here in verse 44. He says, You're of your father, the devil, and the lusts or the desires of your father you'll do. What's the description of, of Satan? He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. I mean, we could spend just a whole bunch of time just talking about verse 44. Satan's the originator of lies. He's the, he's the original opposition to God. He introduced opposition to God into humanity. Okay? And so by... These people, but in any person, by refusing truth, refusing Jesus' words, they are essentially siding with Satan. They're opposing themselves to God. And they evidence that by the refusal of truth. Verse 45, Jesus says, And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. I'm giving you truth. You won't listen. Okay, we've been going here for a little bit. It's a bit of a long video. Um, so we'll end it here. I'd ask you to do this. This is a long passage. I'm not going to give you a specific point of application. What I'd like you to do is, once the video ends here, is take, to take the time to read back over uh, the passage and write down, how does this apply to me? 
I'd challenge you to come up with one or two things that you could pull out of this passage and say, if Jesus is talking to all these people who won't believe him, how does this apply to me? So I hope it's a challenge to you. Um, I hope this is a, a bolster to your, your, your Bible reading, a good supplement, um, and that's, uh, it's encouraging to you. Okay? All right, thanks for your time, and uh, we will see you next time. Thanks.